Now, as, uh, as Christians, as a church, uh, we sing hymns, don't we? We've been doing that so far. And I wonder what your favourite hymn or song, perhaps a non-Christian song as well, I wonder what your favourite song is. Maybe that's too limited. You can't think what your favourite song is. Uh, maybe what you, what you kind of go to, maybe you've got a, a favourite music artist or a favourite group that you go to now and again. That could be a Christian uh, musician or, or, or non-Christian But I'm taking a guess, a wild guess here, that perhaps the reason why you like his or her music or their music is perhaps because the words mean something to you within those songs. Maybe there's been something that has happened in your life, something so significant that you've been through certain circumstances that you hear that song and you're like, yeah, I get that. I can relate to that song. And most of the time... The light songs, um, the empty songs with light, insignificant words, most of the time they don't stand the test of time, unless it's something like Yellow Submarine or something by the Beatles. But um, they might be in the charts, won't they, for a few weeks, um, but then they're forgotten by most people. Um, Not all the time, but most of the times. The songs that last, the songs that will be remembered, are usually the songs that have the words, the lyrics, that reflect what we've been through. Now, I wonder as we, uh, how many of you could relate to the song, the hymn, the psalm there we just read in Psalm 88. I mean, the ver- very first words there of Psalm 88, it says, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. And now, I wonder what, uh, let's forget uh, non-Christian music aside and everything like that a second, I wonder what your favourite psalm is. And again, it's a guess, not always, but... Most likely our favourite psalm is usually the most common ones, isn't it? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And we like reading that, perhaps we like singing that. Psalm 27 is a great psalm, one of my favourite psalms. The Lord is my light and my salvation, who shall I fear? And uh, Psalm 51, one of my favourite ones as well. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Uh, Perhaps a favourite psalm for new parents as well, Psalm 139. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. It's unlikely that Psalm 88 is your favourite psalm to go to. It's not exactly the psalm you go to when you need encouragement, is it? Psalm 88 isn't your feel-good, everything-will-be-all-right-in-the-end kind of psalm. In fact, it is the darkest psalm in all of scripture. And even as, we, is, even as I read it, even as you read it, perhaps you could feel the despair of the psalmist's words there. So I'm, I'm sorry, maybe this is not the encouraging, upbeat sermon that you've come along for uh, tonight to, uh, to, to church. But in fact, as I, as I think as I mentioned this, this morning, um, even as I was preparing to speak from this psalm, I think this psalm, I will now treasure this psalm in a different way than I have the other psalms. All the psalms end on some kind of note of of trust and worship, some kind of light. This psalm ends with without any light, without any hope. It simply concludes Psalm, um, verse 18, my companions have become darkness, or another translation, darkness is my closest friend. The end, they didn't live happily ever after. Now, despite the, the, the depression and the darkness of this psalm, actually there is hope to be found in this, and that's what we're going to draw out. Um, we're going to look at four reasons why this psalm can give us hope in our difficult circumstances. And we're human, we live in a broken world, we will face dif- difficult circumstances. So rather than breaking this psalm down into four neat little sections, like, you know, section one verses one to four, we're just going to look at four lessons that this, this psalm teaches us. So first lesson is, you can cry out to God. Point one, you can cry out to God. Now, I know that sounds obvious, you can cry out to God. But I think what we need to remember is that, and remind ourselves that this is refreshing, that this psalm was written by a real person who was a real believer who was really feeling and suffering the things written here. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the author of this psalm, um, we see before verse 1, don't we? It seems um, that Heman, the Ezraite, he's apparently the author. 
I don't think it's a stretch to say that he suffered from some kind of depression. Maybe he was seriously ill. Or maybe, just like many of us, he was struggling spiritually. Maybe he was struggling in his faith. Uh, We don't know what his struggle was. But what what we do know is he's felt this way since his youth, verse 15. He feels abandoned by God, verse 14. Abandoned by his friend's neighbor, verse 18. Abandoned by his friends again, verse 8. And he feels so desperate in his situation, he feels that his prayers are going on unanswered, verses 13 and 14. And so there's huge depth to this psalm, isn't there? There's huge depth. Look, look at the, the wording of the depth there. Um, verse 3, my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Shoal. Verse 6 says, you have put me in the depth of the pit, in the, dark, in the regions of dark and deep. Verse 16, it says, your wrath has swept over me, your dreadful assaults destroy me. And again, verse 18, darkness is my closest friends. We can hear the the anguish and the depression and the the anxiety of this psalm. But who's this anxiety and and anguish? Who's it directed towards? Who's who's this sorrow directed towards? Well, it's directed to his Father in heaven, isn't it? And, And again, that reminds us, brother, sister, here, you can cry out to God in your suffering. You can cry out to God in your depression. Remember, God is big enough to deal with your honest cries to him. Because underneath all this pain, underneath all this despair, the psalmist knows that God is the one that saves. Verse 1, O oh God, the God of my salvation. God, He knows that the psalmist one is... The psalmist knows that God's the one he can cry out to honestly. Verse 9, every day I call out to you. I'm sure there's perhaps many believers here tonight. And in some ways have felt like Psalm 88. Actually, that might be your situation, situation at the moment. I don't know each bit of your lives. Maybe this is where you're at. Maybe you're in the depths. You're in the pain of this and the suffering. And actually, Psalm 88 can kind of give voice to your pain. We can approach our Heavenly Father. It's Father's Day, we hopefully fathers are approachable, but we can approach this Heavenly Father with raw honesty. We don't need to pretend everything's okay when it comes to God. We don't have to hide the pain, the emotions, the tears, the, the distress. You can use this psalm, when you don't know how to pray and you're in the depths, you can use this psalm to cry out to God. And this psalm gives you permission To bring your deepest, your darkest emotions to God. And the amazing thing is God's not repulsed by that. You can cry out to him. That's our first point. But secondly, you can share your deepest pain. I know that sounds a similar point. But secondly, you can share your deepest pain. With with technology these days, we've got the words on the screen. Some people like using the hymn books when we sing in church. But we're blessed enough to have the screens here to make life easier. But what we need to remember is the book of Psalms was a hymn book for God's people, wasn't it? The Psalms would have been sung publicly together by God's people. There at the temple, singing publicly together. Perhaps the leader at the front, like Mark did earlier, perhaps he would say, turn to hymn number 23, turn to Psalm 23, and they would have sung joyfully together. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 88, isn't it encouraging? Psalm 88 would have been a psalm they would have sung publicly together. Yes, even Psalm 88. And in that, that gives us some hope to hold on to, I think. Psalm 88 would have been sung by God's people loudly. Um, and it shows, as, as, you, as believers would have sung this psalm together, it shows that God doesn't expect believers to cover up what's really going on in their lives. Because... Well, th- the thing is, when we hear these, these words here, this might make us think, well, didn't the Israelites face wandering in the wilderness for years and years because of grumbling against God? It makes us think, well, God's against this grumbling and, and complaining. So how has Psalm 88 made it into the best hymn book of all time? I mean, if I were writing God's hymn book to make it into the Bible, and I had some kind of input of what it would say um, and what this psalm looked like. I would have looked at this psalm and said to the author, I think this psalm needs a verse or two about some kind of hope. 
Um, and the last word of the psalm definitely shouldn't be darkness. This is way too much for people. But that's not the case. This psalm's just honest. And it sometimes, I guess you know what it feels like, sometimes it just feels like, sometimes life that just feels like there's, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. And Psalm 88 seems to end on that. We get those times when perhaps life just looks so bleak, we can pr- cry out in brokenness to God. We cry out, where are you, God? I know, I know you're there. I know there's light, but I can't see it. So please, please show me. And again, this psalm would have been sung together publicly by God's people. And so as they sung that publicly, sharing these deep emotions, it's encouraging you to share with God's people. Maybe you arrive here at church on a Sunday and hopefully you don't think this, but maybe you arrive here at church on a Sunday, you look around and you think everyone else here, oh, they've got life sorted. No one's feeling like I'm feeling. No one's feeling the, the anxiety and the darkness that I'm feeling. There's no space in their thinking. There's no space in their theology for how I'm feeling. And so this psalm is encouraging us to share with others. And can I just say, if you are a believer here and you're speaking to someone who is feeling like Psalm 88, can I make a suggestion? Don't try and fix them. Listen to them. Understand them. Pray with them. When you're listening to someone and you immediately, I'm sure with good intentions, but you immediately, you want to help them and you fix them and you say, look, if this is how you're feeling, this is what you need to do. These are the steps you need to take. This is what you need to think about. Actually, when you react like that, the strength and the confidence you have makes them feel worse and they retreat into themselves further. Ultimately, you can't fix them anyway. Some problems are bigger than you, but problems are not bigger than God. So sit with them, listen, understand them and pray with them. But ultimately this psalm is encouraging us, yes to share with others, but ultimately to share with God, to pray to him honestly. Because actually Psalm 88 isn't like the faithless grumbling of the Israelites, because Psalm 88 reminds us who we are praying to. We're praying to our maker and our king. Uh, the, the, The sorrow And the pain the author is experiencing, it's different from the grumbling of the Israelites. The author isn't faithless, he is faithfully struggling. He is faithfully struggling. And we're reminded, aren't we, that this psalm, it shows us that God is a God, firstly, that saves, verse 1. That God is loving, verse 11. That doesn't sound like faithless grumbling, does it? That his ways are wonderful, that his deeds are righteous, verse 12. The psalm shows us that we can be honest with God about how we're feeling. We can share our deepest, hardest heartaches in a way that honours God rather than grumbling against God. So, third point, thirdly, you can be honest about the darkness. We can be honest about the darkness. We, we definitely know that life is not like that song, um, Sunshine, Lollipops and Rainbows, don't we? Life's not like that. Life is tough. In Newtown, uh, a couple of months ago, we had a man called Paul Mallard uh, speak with us, um, whose wife is, is in a wheelchair um, and has been suffering for years and years and years. And he said, um, as he spoke with us, he said, the only qualification to suffering is living long enough. Everyone will face suffering to a certain degree. You've either gone through it, or you will go through it, or you're currently in it. And so Psalm 88 is a brutally honest psalm about living in a fallen world. I mean, how many, how many of you here have felt like verse 6? You've put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions of dark and deep. How many of you have felt like verse 7? You have overwhelmed me with your waves. That sometimes, how, much, how often does life just feel like you're just trying to keep your head above water? These, I know these verses here in Psalm 88, they're not exactly verses uh, to put on your fridge door or to put on uh, as a picture in, the, in your home. Or, to, you know, sometimes people on social media put these lovely verses with a lovely landscape in the background. These aren't exactly the, the verses to do that, you know. Lovely landscape in the d- background. Darkness is my closest friend. doesn't seem to work. But it shows us we live in a fallen world. And so let's be honest about the darkness around us. 
And actually many people um, suffer with depression and anxiety from time to time. Apparently around 15 to 20% of the population of Britain um, take, are on some kind of antidepressant or uh, uh, anxiety medication, which may mean actually there's a few in this room um, who have struggled or are struggling with this kind of pain. While many people, and perhaps we know of people, while many people come out of these depressive seasons, of seasons with anxiety, or sometimes, let's be honest, spiritually dark seasons, there are those, and perhaps those that we know, who will just cut, struggle constantly. Actually, the, the depression, the, the anxiety and the darkness never seems to fade. And there's actually a horrendous theology going round that will be get saying, if you pray hard enough, if you believe hard enough, if you do the right things, God will make all your life that you wanted it to be. But actually, real life does tell us something else. We know that's not the case, don't we? And this psalm tells us that that's the case. Encouragingly, Psalm 88 is written by an honest, genuine, but struggling believer. You long to feel, perhaps you, you long to feel the joy that the gospel brings, but sometimes it, perhaps for you it feels like God has hidden himself, he's turned away, and you know that's not the way you should be thinking, but that's where your thoughts are going. The sun doesn't always come out tomorrow. We don't get the job we wanted. We face another miscarriage. The diagnosis is not what we hoped for. Marriages end, people get sick and die. And I know this is very, very doom and gloom. But isn't this the world in which we live? It's fallen. It's crippled with sin and needing Jesus. And all of what I've just mentioned, all that darkness and all that pain, is because sin has entered the world and the world is not as it should be. It's actually only Christians that view the world for what it actually is, fallen. And so brothers and sisters here, be honest with each other about the darkness. Uh, and Psalm 88, and so Psalm 88 it reflects our pain and it gives us a permission for us to be honest with God. So be honest about the darkness. But fourthly and finally, um, you can trust your saviour. Fourthly, finally, you can trust your saviour. The good news is God doesn't want the sufferer to stay like this forever. He doesn't want the sufferer to stay in this place of darkness and depression. God wants to lead them out of it. God doesn't condemn the sufferer here for being in darkness, but he doesn't want the sufferer to stay in this place either. Now, you're a good Bible-believing evangelical church, and I'm sure you're constantly reminded from this pulpit here that all of scripture, all of this, from the first page to the last, points to Christ. And so this would really encourage us because Psalm 88, with all its depth, with all its darkness, is no different. Psalm 88 points us to Christ. Because all the questions, all the conundrums that this psalmist is talking about, that he was broken over, that he was crying over, all those questions and, and, and conundrums are answered in Jesus. A Jesus who came to rescue and to restore what has been broken. He listens to our deepest and honest cries. Because Jesus came into our brokenness, didn't he? And he became broken for us. Jesus came into our brokenness. We're told that Jesus wept and one day he will wipe every tear from our eye. If we trust him. The one thing Psalm 88 reminds us of is actually we need an intercessor. We need someone to stand between us and God the Father. We need an intercessor. Because we, we know our hearts. We know sometimes when we, we're in those times of, of, um, of darkness and the depth. that We don't know how to say. We don't know how to express what we're going through. We don't even know how to pray. And in those times Jesus intercedes for us, when we don't know how to pray, that he is there for us. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit is also praying for us. When we can't find the words to say, um, that our hearts long to say, the Holy Spirit cries out for us. Um, Romans chapter 8, 26, 
in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes to us through wordless groans. I'm sure there's some of you here and you know what it feels like to have wordless groans. And in those moments, you don't know how to say things to God. The Holy Spirit acts in those moments on your behalf. You know, what a comfort that is, isn't it? When life's pains and life's struggles seem to mute us, the Spirit speaks for us. And there are other Psalms that we should definitely meditate on, definitely meditate on. Psalms like Psalm 27, Psalm 139. And as a whole, the Bible ends in hope, doesn't it? As a whole, the Bible ends in hope. But Psalm 88 is a loving reminder from God that the experience of darkness um, is common to all of us before we experience the joy of heaven. And so, brothers and sisters, if you're feeling and experiencing Psalm 88 type days, uh, bring this in your mind, that you're not alone as you think you might feel, that he's with us in it. He's with you in the darkness and the struggles all the time. Isn't it just like the God that we worship? Isn't it just like God to make the darkest psalm a light for those who struggle? I think wonderfully, wonderfully Psalm 88 is in our Bibles. It doesn't need to be explained away. Psalm 88 is an honest, but, uh, written by an honest but struggling believer. The psalm would have been sung just as loudly as uh, the other psalms of praise are sung. Psalm 88 isn't hidden away in some kind of appendix somewhere. Psalm 88 isn't the psalm that let the, 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 the side down. It's a prayer of the heart which is approved by God, which is why he wanted it in his inspired words. This isn't the normal expectation for the Christian life. It's not. But how encouraging is it to know you can feel this way, that you can speak this way and still be a believer. God willing, you'll great grieve me that I'm so grateful that Psalm 88 is in Scripture. But as I conclude now, as I said, Psalm 88 is written by an honest but struggling believer. Another such hymn that was written by a struggling believer is a man you might have heard of, um, William Cooper. William Cooper. And despite the struggles that he faced in his life, he also talks about the change that Jesus made in his life. If you want to search him, the way you spell Cooper, by the way, is it sounds like Cowper. It's um, C-O-W-P-E-R. And we're singing a hymn in a minute, so I'm sure you'll see his name. But William Cooper, when he was 32, he met Jesus. And he didn't mean meet Jesus in a youth group uh, or children's group. He didn't meet Jesus in what we're doing today. I'm at a church service. He didn't meet Jesus there. He met Jesus in an asylum after he tried to kill himself for the third time. And Cooper, um, his father, was a chaplain to King George II, and he wanted to raise Cooper to be a deeply religious man. And at six years old, his father sent him to a boarding school to learn and to, 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 uh, um, to learn theology, but Cooper didn't enjoy that environment at all. And what started out with an older boy bullying him quickly turned into abuse. And from that time on, Cooper struggled with darkness and depression. And that seemed to be a constant in his life. As it says there in verse 15, afflicted and close to death from my youth up. That seemed to be Cooper's stage. But one day, uh, one ray of light that appeared for Cooper, when he was a young man, he met and fed in love with a woman and he was in this relationship with her for years and they planned to marry. But in the end, her father forbid the marriage. And Cooper felt some kind of comfort in his poetry um, and music. And he was very successful um, in many ways. Looking at Cooper's life from the outside, looking in, you wouldn't have seen his struggles. He had a best-selling publication a book review of his writings by Benjamin Franklin, internationally known, but to Cooper it meant nothing. Cooper attempted suicide several times, and his doctor happened to be a Christian, 
and would, when he was recovering from those times, he would read the Bible to him. And when this doctor read Romans chapter 3 to him, he read these words, For all have sinned, and for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And the doctor read those words, they went straight into Cooper's heart. And Cooper himself wrote, when he heard those words, he wrote this, Immediately I will receive the strength to, to believe. And the full beams of the sun of righteousness shone upon me. I saw the sufficiency of the atonement that Jesus had made, my pardon in his blood, the full and completeness of my justification. In that moment, I believed and received the gospel. Cooper met Jesus in the asylum. And you half expect me to say, from that moment on, everything changed for Cooper. But no. Cooper never had what would be considered the perfect Christian life. He continued to struggle with loneliness and depression all the days of his life. But in one of his darkest moments, in one of when he was feeling pain, his his hope in the gospel remains. And one of his deepest, darkest hours, he wrote these words. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, Wash all my sins away. So loneliness, darkness and depression were not the final words for Cooper. As he wrote the words in that hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. So the Christian with anxiety, depression, illness or darkness, despite your struggle, despite how you feel, redeeming love is also your theme. And will be until you're there face to face with love himself in glorious light where there will be no more darkness. Maybe sometimes we're guilty of thinking, how often have you thought in your struggles, God can't relate to how I'm feeling. God doesn't know what I'm going through. But as you think that, as you get those times of feeling like that, cast your mind and look to a lonely, twisted, tortured figure on a cross. Nails through his hands and feet, back lacerated, forehead bleeding from thorns, mouth dry, unbearably thirsty, in darkness because the sun has stopped shining. And as you look at that image, as you look at that figure, think, that's the God for me. A God who entered our world of flesh, uh, flesh, blood and tears. And yes, he does know completely how you feel. And so I'm finishing now, but Christians cannot... Read Psalm 88 and think, this is a description of Jesus, the man of sorrows. Christ entered the darkness and was forsaken, so you may never be forsaken. As you read Psalm 88 and relate it to yourself, also read it and relate it to Jesus and think, he experienced this for me. We have a God who didn't stay distant from suffering, but he entered suffering so he could end it forever.